Hello and welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit and thank you for joining us for today's session. We are delighted um, to be hosting this session, Open Pedagogy, supporting faculty and students with remote learning. My name is Sarah Cohen and I am the Senior Managing Director at the Open Textbook Network. If you are not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, soon to be called the Open Education Network. We are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I will be serving as the facilitator for today's session, and I am joined by Tanya Groves, our Director of Educational Programs at the OTN, who will be moderating questions for our presenters. Before we begin, we'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the summit is OTN Summit 20. We are live tweeting our sessions, so please join us on Twitter at open underscore textbooks. This webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you have been muted. The video and transcriptions will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. The last several minutes of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We are committed at the OTN to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. You can also see uh, all of those links are shared in the chat today. And now, please join me in welcoming today's presenters. Lindsay Gum is an assistant professor and the scholarly communications librarian at Roger Williams University where she has been leading OER adoption, revision, and creation since 2016, focusing heavily on OER-enabled pedagogy collaborations with faculty. She co-chairs the Rhode Island State Open Ed Textbook Initiative Steering Committee and is a fellow for the Open, pardon me, and is a fellow for Open Education at the New England Board of Higher Education. She was awarded a 2019-2020 OER Research Fellowship to conduct research on undergraduate student awareness of copyright and fair use and open licensing as it pertains to their participation in OER-enabled pedagogy projects. Amanda Larson is the Affordable Learning Instructional Consultant at The Ohio State University. Previously, the Open Education Librarian at Penn State University and the OER teaching assistant at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she worked to support faculty adopting, adapting, and authoring OER. She is passionate about providing opportunities to dream big, count small wins, and supporting folks working to make education open, accessible, and diverse. It is my pleasure to welcome you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so I'm Mayda Larson. Um, hello friends. It's nice to be here with you today. Um, in the bio I wrote for Sarah, um, I made sure to mention sort of like all of the places that I have done this work because open pedagogy has really been sort of the throughput through all of those positions. Um, and I have moved from helping faculty support uh, the creation of their stuff because there wasn't anything available in their fields and um, later I will share some of those small wins um, and now I've worked and then I worked as sort of like the open education librarian who tried to do everything all at once not super successful to try and do everything all at once um, and now I am focused really largely on introducing open pedagogy at Ohio State um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay to say a little bit more about herself Thanks, Amanda. Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Gum, and thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. Um, 
I am a librarian, uh, first and foremost. So I come into this space very much um, through the lens of information literacy. And so I am in the classroom a lot of times with students and collaborating with faculty on research assignments they may have. But um, more recently, in the last five years, I've been working really closely with faculty um, with OER, but on my campus, um, I work at a, a mid-sized independent institution and the culture there from the start has been that faculty are far more interested and their ears really perk up when they learn about um, how they can leverage the licensing structures of OER to kind of shake up their pedagogy. So um, I've found it really interesting over the last few years to kind of put my librarian hat on and see how we can work with students to integrate the info lit frames um, for higher education as they blend with open pedagogy. And I think they're like the perfect match made in heaven. Um, so yeah, I'm a librarian. Um, I do a lot of other things other than OER, but this is really where my heart is. So I'm really excited to be talking about it today with Amanda. And I think Amanda and I were chatting when we were kind of thinking about how, how we would present this. And we wanted to make it very clear that, um, you know, we are not experts per se in this area, but I think that's really important to convey because often we've, you know, many of us feel kind of that imposter syndrome and open pedagogy is something that everyone can participate in um, and it means something a little different to everyone. So we really just wanted to put that out there so that um, maybe more people might gain some confidence or just feel less intimidated to dip their toes in the water. So. Okay, so what will we cover today? Um, we will start with some definitions because there are several definitions in this space um, and some people relate more to one definition over another. So we wanted to share just kind of a variety of the, the more mainstream ones that are cited often in the literature and talked about, um, but that does not mean that we are presenting a comprehensive list of what is out there for open ped. Um, then we wanted to show you or just give you some examples of what this might look like in a classroom. Um, and we'll talk about the shakeup of COVID-19 and how that's kind of forced or if you're an optimist, encouraged us to look um, at different ways that we can leverage open ped in a remote learning environment. Um, and then we thought it was really important to talk about how do we support faculty who are interested in participating in this work and really how do we support students um, when we're talking about agency and helping them participate ethically and legally in this space. And then we're gonna end with just giving you some excellent resources to get you started if, if this sounds like something that you wanna get into. So I'm gonna jump right in to one of the first definitions that we have. Um, and I really love this one from Catherine Cronin. Um, Catherine is an incredibly, uh, thoughtful educator and scholar in this space. And I really love her definition of open educational practices where she says it's to use, reuse, it's the use, reuse and creation of OER and collaborative pedagogical practices employing social and participatory technologies for interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation and sharing and empowerment of learners. Um, and the more I read that, when I put that there, I really, you know, thought to myself, like, this is what I want to embody in my classroom when I work with faculty and students. Amanda? So I pulled a definition from Open Pedagogy by Robin DeRosa of University of Duke County. And what I like is that they connect open pedagogy to social justice. And that's sort of how I entered this space is thinking about equity and um, I always sort of lead when I talk about OER with thinking about the ways that it can make education more equitable. And I also like that they situate it as a praxis. So it's a praxis, a place where theories about learning technology and teaching and social justice enter into a conversation with each other. So we're practicing this work and they inform the, the development of educational practices and structures. So it's a lot about like 
throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, but doing it in a way that uses open educational resources as sort of the springboard. Next slide, please. And they continue to say that it's an access oriented commitment to learner driven education, which to me is putting students sort of in the driver's seat and thinking about how they can have agency in their education and instead of con just consuming from a stage on the stage kind of model, how can they be content creators and really make those connections that make the things that they're being taught into concrete skills that they can then transfer as they continue their education. And this, they also talk about enabling students to enter the public knowledge commons. And as a librarian, to me, that means learning how to function in a public digital space. So what are the concerns around privacy and information security that they need to know to do that? It also talks about like teaching them what the licenses mean and how they can use their intellectual property. And then insisting on the centrality of the five R's to this work. So making sure that the open education resources that we're using as a platform actually are engaging in those five R's from David Wiley to really allow the most reuse and remix and redistribution of the work that they're creating and that they understand those and can choose which license they want. Next slide. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and I was very lucky to be able to be Lauren Ray's mentor in the Spark Open Education Leadership Program. And one of the projects that came out of that for her was a series of slides that she shared with a Creative Commons license for folks doing this kind of work to talk to their fellow subject liaisons in the libraries. But I think we could also use these materials to talk to faculty. Um, and she may be doing that as well. Um, and I really like the way that she distilled it down into these really discrete bullet points. So it leverages the open nature, nature of OER to facilitate learning. Um, there's an emphasis on community and collaboration. And I think creating OER in general should be a collaboration, but when we're bringing students into the mix, it really needs to be a collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, we share resources and ideas and power. Um, renewable versus disposable assignments. So instead of just having an assignment that you give a student that goes away when the LMS closes at the end of the semester, they're building on content that might continue to form the basis of education for future students or their own work. Um, connection to the wider public, teaching them how to act in sort of public discourse and engage with those ideas of agency and privacy. And then um, for example, the example she pulls are students creating, annotating, curating, updating or adapting an openly licensed work. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so Amanda made some mention to Wiley's five R's that many of us are very familiar with, um, but I pulled his piece from 2013 because there were really only four R's um, that he presented at that time. Um, and I wrote them down, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Um, and I, put this because this is where he starts to talk about the disposable assignment and transitioning into renewable assignments and what can we do with resources that aren't traditionally copyrighted, right? How does learning change when the licensing structures of these learning resources also change? Um, and in 2017, he kind of presents us with the, the fifth R, retain. So students are able to retain these materials in perpetuity um, and this idea of OER enabled pedagogy. So how, again, that concept of like, how can we teach differently when we're not restricted by the barriers of copyright? Um, and I know a lot of my faculty really grapple with that. They get frustrated when they can't do certain things in the classroom just because of copyright. Um, so this concept of OER enabled pedagogy really allows the faculty to collaborate with the students as content creators, um, and they're not bound by those restrictions of copyright. And we saved this one for last, and I think this is a really important um, thing that as educators and facilitators of open pedagogy, we need to really think about. Um, so Rajiv Jangjiani presented us with the five R's for open pedagogy. Um, which you know kind of play off the five r's um, of oer from david wiley so we have respect reciprocate risk reach and resist um, 
And if you just Google this, you can, you can read the breakdown of Rajiv's and he, he makes sure to say, these are my personal um, reflections on these five R's of open pedagogy. This is what it means to me. Um, it doesn't mean that these five R's have to mean the same thing to me when I'm in the classroom with my students, but I really relate to these five R's. Um, we really want to think about agency a lot when we're having our students and our faculty participate in these different pedagogies. We wanna respect that agency. We wanna help un students understand that they are owners of their intellectual property and they do have the right to decide what they wanna do with that. Um, risk is another really important one that I like to think about and that different populations have different levels of risk in our society um, and especially when they're participating in these. So if we're thinking about different minoritized students or faculty, um, women have different levels of risk. Um, so just keeping these, these five R's kind of in the forefront when we're developing different projects to engage our students and faculty in is really, really important. Um, so with that, Amanda and I um, wanted, we, we kind of showed you this array of definitions and we wanted to share with you what open pedagogy means to us individually. So Amanda's going to start us off. So what is open pedagogy to me? Um, I think it's definitely leveraging the affordances of OER in teaching. So taking advantage of the license to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do. But also, um, I have seen the way that it sort of changes the way faculty teach, and I'll come back to that during my aha moments. Um, it provides agency to both the instructor over, both the instructor and the student over course content. So as an instructor, they can decide if material that doesn't meet their needs in the OER, they can remove it, or they can change it in a different location and teach it in the sequence that they want. And a lot of times they're not used to having sort of that agency anymore because they've been locked into a traditional textbook for a long time and they get into a habit of teaching it a certain way, even though it doesn't necessarily fit the, way, the model of the, how they would like to teach. And it gives students agency over their course content because they can learn about all of these different facets, their intellectual property, privacy, uh, the Creative Commons licenses, and then they get to make a decision about how they share their work. Um, it requires collaborative engagement to create content. So there's a lot here where you can have students work together to create content and collaborate in units. It's a collaboration between the instructor and the students if they're like building an open textbook together. Um, and for me, it's also an opportunity to try out other complementary pedagogies. So for example, um, you could try a racial justice curriculum through the OER that you're using. That could be something that you bring to the table. You could be trying out different forms of digital pedagogy. Um, you could also be trying ungrading or building your syllabus with your students at the same time. And those all can link up pretty nicely with using an open educational resource and then open pedagogical teaching. Um, witnessing aha moments with faculty as they embrace pedagogical practices. So every time I have worked with a faculty creating a book for them, they have discovered something through the OER that is going to facilitate their teaching to be different in the future. Whether they're making connections be like they want to make, say, a GIF of an anatomical um, shoulder movement. So how the shoulder rotates and how they that changed the way that they wanted the content in their tables in a book to function. That they wanted the nursing students to be able to sort through them by different ligaments and things so that they could see how things connect in the body. They wouldn't be able to do that with a static text necessarily. Um, and then with my librarian hat on, um, it's obviously a great opportunity, in my opinion, to engage students in different kinds of literacies, information, digital, and privacy. And um, moving forward, I think also it's a great place to be like thinking about how information literacy and fact checking goes together for the materials that they're bringing into the OER as if they're working on it together is a really great intersection. Back to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, so what does open pedagogy mean to me? Um, so for me, I've found true joy, um, and I mean that genuinely, in helping students value themselves as knowledge creators and real 
quote unquote authors for an audience beyond the classroom walls. Um, it's really an amazing feeling to, to watch students participate in this and see themselves or to, to witness them grow from the beginning of semester and see their confidence really increase as they understand that their, their knowledge is valued, right? And their knowledge will carry on to the next semester and be built upon by other students and used as learning resources. Um, I really love helping students kind of see themselves as authors. And for me, um, I've been thinking a lot over the last few years about as a librarian, as a scholarly communications librarian, I work really closely with faculty, encouraging them to publish in open access um, journals, right? And to, to see the value of that. Why would they want to do that? And for me, this opportunity in working with students now and helping them see themselves as open scholars now, hopefully when they enter programs, PhD programs or become faculty themselves or in any context, they already have that kind of intuitive, like, yeah, I, I want to share my knowledge beyond, right? I don't wanna restrict um, my knowledge behind copyright. Um, so I think there's a really huge opportunity here to help them develop that identity as knowledge creators now um, as undergraduates or graduates so that when they enter society per se, they're already there, they understand the value of it. Um, and then another one is helping them understand the rights and responsibilities that come with that auth authorship. So helping them understand that their intellectual property is theirs. They have agency over it. They get to, to, to decide how they want to share it, openly license it or not, right? That is their choice. Um, but if they do, if they are participating in these projects and putting knowledge out there for the public, there are certain responsibilities that come with that, right? Um, and then leveraging open licenses to teach students essential information literacy concepts. So I can't help it. I'm a librarian. That's this is what really gets me going. Um, it's been, you know, it, uh, information literacy instruction, like the the one shot 50 to 80 minute sessions for librarians is so hard to engage students that you might see only one, one or two times a semester and then maybe not again for four years. Um, I think this really gives us some wonderful opportunities to really hammer in those information literacy concepts in a way that you can do it in one session sometimes and it sticks with students. Um, and I found that to be really helpful. Um, and then uh, sim similar to Amanda, I love witnessing aha moments that surface between students as they collaborate on projects. Um, so I'm lucky in a sense that I, the faculty who I've established relationships with um, who are participating in, in these projects, they allow me as the librarian to come in multiple times during the semester. Um, so I actually do get to see that genesis of the beginning of a project and where they end up at the end. And I'm in there, not always facilitating, just kind of there to help. And I witness a lot of students being like, oh yeah, like Lindsay talked about that. And this, this is what that is right here. Um, it's really cool. Um, and then for me, again, just tying back to Rajiv's five R's, um, making sure we really kind of, kind of are constantly keeping them in the forefront of, of what we're doing with our students and our faculty. Amanda? So I wanted to talk through some examples um, of what this could look like. So a disposal assignment, in my opinion, and the one I always like petition for people to get rid of first are discussion board posts. Like discussion board posts are so bad that they've become a meme. I saw on Twitter the other day, somebody posted discussion board post. I love bread. Second student, dear John, I also love bread. It's really great how you decided to announce to everyone that you love bread. And as somebody who's done a lot of discussion board posts as a student, I mean, they often feel like busy work and that they're meaningless and instructors are frustrated by the way that students respond to each other because a lot of times they'll just like either randomly pick somebody to chime in on and it's not like a meaningful discussion or 
they only are like sort of working with their clique of friends and it becomes pretty obvious. So these typically go where they post a response to a signed reading and then you have to re also respond to two of your classmates. So a way that we could change this in with open pedagogy is to make it a renewable assignment and uh, we could do that through annotation. Um, so they could still be responding to an assigned reading and they could annotate a portion of the text that they struggled with that week. So this is helping the instructor know where students are sort of falling behind, what concepts they're struggling with. Um, and then seek and share, this is the part that makes it more renewable, is you could send them out to find a piece of media. So it could be an image, a video, or a GIF, or even a related text that relates to a passage that they read. So they have to take the material that they've read, think about it, and then transfer that skill of I've read about this concept and I understand it enough to go find something um, that relates to it. And then going forward, you could incorporate those things that the students find into the text going forward if they help illustrate a concept. Next slide, please. Another disposable assignment. So I worked with a lot of foreign language folks and I don't find that vocabulary worksheets are necessarily terrible, um, but a lot of times it's fill out X many worksheets with the vocabulary and then you have to wait for feedback and there's not necessarily a chance to really learn and grow off of the feedback that you get necessarily. Um, so instead you could do a vocabulary practice. So um, if you're working in an open textbook, you could add something called H5P, which are um, HTML5 interactive um, assessments and you could build out a vocabulary lesson and they get immediate feedback so they would find out how many they got wrong and you can set them up so students can continue practicing the skills so that they can get better and i think that the immediate feedback is the portion that is really useful because it gives them a quick concept check to see how they're doing with what they're remembering from what they've read and ability to practice you can also set up flashcards, and um it just seems a little more engaging and provides that immediate feedback to students. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of something that I work on every semester with a faculty member. Um, and these are student designed renewable websites. So they are the whole website itself has an open license on it. Um, and I am going to read off my notes because I have so many good things in here. I just don't want to forget any of them. <laughs> So, um, like I said, each semester students um, in this general science or general education science course, they build upon previous student websites. Um, so they end up serving as learning objects for the next semester students, which I just think is amazing. Um, there's no textbook in this. These websites are the textbooks for these, these new students that come in. And in this particular course, because it's a general education science course, um, they focus on major topics that are covered in the lecture and lab. And this particular instructor, um, my wonderful colleague, Dr. Heather Maselli, she focuses this course on topics where science and society intersect, um, often in controversial um, ways. So they discuss climate change, DNA, GMOs, space, space exploration, vaccines, and artificial intelligence. Um, so essentially, the students, when they enter the course, they sign up for a group. So this is a, a group project, um, and all of these different topics have different um, students in the group, and she allows them to kind of enter the topic that might inspire or interest them the most. Um, and the great thing about this class <laughs> is that these students do not want to be there, right? This is a general education science course. These are non-majors. Um, it's always an 8 a.m. section. Um, they're from different disciplines and they're often really intimidated to be back in a classroom where they're in, in a science classroom, right? These are dance majors. These are education majors. These are business majors. They want nothing to do with science. Um, and this is typically the last formal science education they will receive. Um, so I've worked a lot with Heather on creating an OER enabled pedagogy collaboration, um, which really puts these students in the driver's seat and it allows them to become the authority on a topic that 
they would probably never likely have the opportunity to do so. Um, so we start off the semester with the groups reviewing the inherited uh, websites that they have. So if they are working on climate change, the group gets together and I facilitate um, an info lit session that really focuses on, okay, let's evaluate this resource that's in front of you, right? What, um, I want you to check all the sources. Are they relevant? Do they need to be updated? I want you to look at all the images. Are they appropriate? Are they openly licensed? Are the attributions correct, right? So we just do a really general session of um, reviewing this content. And then later in the semester, I do a really thorough workshop on scaffolding the necessary skills that they'll need to participate as contributors. So in the beginning, they're, they're more the evaluators. And then as the semester goes on, they start um, being contributors to the new information that will go into these websites. Um, and really, I focus a lot on the skills that they'll need to both ethically and legally participate. So I spend a lot of time educating them on copyright, fair use, open licensing, and author's rights. Um, and the wonderful thing for me is that because I've established this relationship with this faculty member, she scaffolds um, her homework assignments based on the, the content that I cover in class. So she'll have students to reinforce these concepts. She has students, you know, I want you to go out and find five openly licensed images. Um, and I want you to explain to me what you can and cannot do with them, right? So it's just reinforcing these concepts that I cover in class. Um, and this project is currently in its fifth iteration. And I just want to reinforce that we have stumbled. Um, we have fallen flat on our face, but we have also had some really wonderful aha moments ourselves. So this collaboration has been fantastic um, and we've, we're still figuring it out. And I, I really want to put that out there that don't be afraid to try different things. Um, it's going to take you a while to find a platform that works for you. Um, but it's, it's really fun and it's amazing to see where students may lack confidence in the beginning and at the end of the semester they can fully have a conversation with you about what gmos are and why you know farmers use them and and what the dangers may be or what the dangers people might think um, about them um, so i'll talk a little bit more about these in a second but this is a really an example that i is really close to my heart and that we work on a lot um, but I want to shift quickly to talk about, okay, we've had this incredible disruption in education um, and how do we kind of leverage open pedagogy during this, this time of disruption. So I, I wanted to include this quote um, from Robin DeRosa, who's the director of the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. Um, she, she notes that there is a link between public health and open. The open sharing of research and data can help us quickly collaborate to find medical solutions. Open pedagogy can help us involve our students in our field's responses to the pandemic and remind us that the digital divide can complicate remote learning. And OER can remove barriers for students and faculty who need to shift to more ubiquitously available resources. Open is about public infrastructure more than it is a set of free textbooks. Um, I love this quote as a whole, but, but really that concept of involving our students in our own field's responses and how do we involve them to create materials that go out beyond the classroom um, in response to what's going on right now. And then, so just kind of acknowledging that remote teaching, it challenges us, right? But there's also wonderful opportunities to develop new, new ways to engage our students and really open pedagogy, this, this fully student-centered approach um, to knowledge creation, it, there's endless opportunities. So I really just encourage you to experiment and be creative. Um, and kind of playing off of what Robin said, there's these opportunities for faculty and students to view their discipline through the lens of timely and relevant public health and social justice issues like COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter by co-creating materials that can be shared and repurposed beyond the classroom and back into the community. Um, 
so I'm just going to really quickly, because I know I don't want to take up too much time, but I wanted to show you. Um, so we had COVID-19 happen, total disruption. And I just showed you this, these student websites um, that I work on all semester with these students and how we had to kind of re-envision and tra transition what we do throughout the semester online. So I was able to kind of establish a relationship in person with the students, right? Because the pandemic kind of happened midway. And so I had already met them, which was great, but I hadn't delivered that in-person workshop that I was referencing about copyright, fair use, open licensing, which is a huge component to this project. Um, and it really goes back to my point of like, it's essential to scaffold these concepts for students. Um, so I'm gonna try to click on this and hopefully this works. Amanda, are you seeing this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I had to very quickly figure out how am I going to deliver this content to students that I usually do in person in an 80 minute session. Um, and it's, it's interactive, it's engaging, I'm asking questions, they're responding. Um, and I knew this was not going to work as like a synchronous session. Um, I was not going to record 80 minutes and have students watch this. So um, Heather and I came up with, she was actually using this this uh, format called HyperDocs um, to kind of carry on her class throughout the semester because she realized the same thing like I'm not going to make these students log into Zoom all the time. So I basically created this um, interactive lesson plan, if you will, to cover all of the topics that I normally would in um, this workshop. So I have them watch a few really short clips on concepts I would cover and probably I normally lecture about this stuff when I'm in front of them. It takes like, you know, 10 minutes. Um, I did do a really quick screencast for them on how to locate openly licensed content because I do cover that in that workshop. Um, and then I asked them to familiarize themselves with the, the Creative Commons licenses. I have them reread something that we have them read at the beginning on OER and student privacy, um, just to kind of reinforce that they have this agency, right? They have rights. Um, there's also a risk they're taking, especially with this project. Um, I mentioned these topics can be quite controversial politically um, in our environment sometimes. So these students are putting out these websites and their names are on them. We give them the choice to not put their names um, or to use a pseudonym, but many students opt to use their names. But we really want to ensure that they understand that internet trolling and cyberbullying is a real thing, especially with controversial topics. So we have them reread that. And then I have them go out and explore um, existing content and see if they can locate the Creative Commons licenses just to get their eyes trained to find those licenses. Um, and then I want them to engage and apply what I've just tried to teach them um, remotely. <laughs> um, so I asked them to um, participate in this. Um, basically, I asked them to draw their favorite animal, which is part of the workshop that I do in person. Um, and I'm going to try to get back there. So let me get out of here. Give me one second, I will share my screen. So I asked them to draw their favorite animal. And in the in-person session, um, they draw their favorite animal and then they have to pass it off to their neighbor or anyone, they just can't have their own in front of them. And then they, I hand out a paper license. So it's one of the, the six Creative Commons licenses or it's a copyright license. Um, and they have to either, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to screen share. <laughs> they have to make some kind of adjustment if they can, if the license allows. Um, and if they cannot, like if it's copyrighted, they have to ask permission. Um, give me one second, guys. So in this new version, this remote version, they have to draw their favorite animal and contribute it to a Google slide. And 
I am not going to show you that because I don't want to get out and be distracted again. But essentially, it's an open Google slide. Each student creates their own. They upload um, an image of an animal that they've drawn and they have to create, um, they have to provide an attribution. They have to select a license. So it's reinforcing those skills that they essentially just learned about agency over their own IP and how they want to share their content. But it's also reinforcing skills of how do I properly give attribution to an image because they have to do all of these things on their websites. Um, and I also held open copyright office hours once a week so students and groups could pop in if they were having questions on, um, you know, we want to we want to do a fair use assessment of this copyrighted image because it's perfect for our website. Can you help us talk through that? So it was an adjustment, but it actually worked really well. Okay, I'm going to pass it off to Amanda. All right, so my experience is not leveraging open pedagogy during COVID-19. Um, so in my role, I was pulled to support the university-wide keep teaching uh, support. And that involved like old school phone reference chat kind of stuff. So answering phone calls and helping people. And the idea is that we'd be helping them set up their courses into um, an online format, format. And if they wanted, get some advice around how to set up the assignments and things going forward. And so what we discovered was that there was a general lack of interest in OER as a solution to moving forward online. They just wanted to like figure out how to triage as quickly as they can and then just move forward. And that there was a general lack of scaffolding for student experience engaging with online educational technology, which is something that I really emphasize when moving into an open pedagogy environment is that there has to be lots of scaffolding. And I was answering calls from students who were not familiar with their LMS to the point that they couldn't send an email through the learning management system to their professor. They didn't really understand how to copy and paste. And they had signed up for a traditional face-to-face -face class and were very, very frustrated. So there needed to be some scaffolding of technology into this remote environment. And if we had had time to sit down with instructors and talk them through moving into an online environment and engaging in open pedagogy as a solution, I think we could have helped uh, alleviate some of those problems. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk a little bit about faculty support and you can go ahead to the next slide. So um, it was really interesting when Lindsay and I got started talking that I had way more experience on sort of like the faculty support side and she had way more experience working with students directly. Um, and so from my experience, again, I'm not an expert, I just have experience. Um, it's really important when you're talking to faculty about open pedagogy to allow them to go at their own pace. So if they are interested but nervous, have them start small and to change one assignment into an open pedagogy format. Um, so it could be that you have them replace that discussion board uh, post that they usually do. Or you might find people who are really ready to do a deep dive and they want to change everything and go all the way with open pedagogy. And then you need to talk them through it like it's a course redesign because it really is. Um, they also really need Creative Commons licensing training. So it's integral that they understand the license of the materials that they're going to use or author and how they can be built upon, particularly if down the road they want to have students contribute to those materials as well. Um, identifying the technology for the project. So what are they going to be building on? What platform? What technology? What are its affordances? And what are sort of the downsides of it? Um, and then also community building. So if you were here last week, you probably joined the faculty learning circles presentation, which is a great way to do that. But it could be as, as simple as getting together them in a group and sort of building community through having them talk about what's working in their courses, what's not working in their courses, have them share an example of an assignment that they've created. And usually in my experience, once you get them sort of talking in that arena, it takes off and they're really happy to share what they're doing. Great, thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, it was really interesting when we, Amanda and I connected, like we just had this really nice balance of, she had so much experience working with faculty and I had a lot more experience working with students. So I, I've learned a lot from her. Um, and I think the reason I have a lot of experience doing student support is because the faculty who are interested um, that I work with, they are very um, uncomfortable 
facilitating those conversations with their students. Um, you know, they know their discipline and that's kind of what they're comfortable with. They, they find this really interesting and they want to engage their students, but they, they see the value in the collaboration with someone like me who can help their students walk through these, these new, very new concepts for them. Um, and so my main thing when you're working with students is that scaffolding is essential. So it is far easier to, um, to engage in an open ped project that you have the opportunity to support students throughout the semester. So there's a lot more opportunities for collaboration with um, librarians and faculty, or if there's someone else on campus doing that work and faculty um, to, to do that scaffolding. So what I really focus in on is the technology, the rights and responsibilities and the agency and privacy. So when we're talking about technology, um, it's important to acknowledge and realize that not all of our students are digital natives like we are always hearing. Um, we can't assume that they are familiar with the platform that the faculty member has chosen to engage. So for example, um, we are using Google Sites for that website project I was talking about. And yes, like all students are familiar with Google and most of their products, but this was brand new for almost every student. They had never done a Google Site. Um, so it was a learning curve and, and just simple things. You have to kind of like do a little bit, bit of handholding, but just being aware that you don't want the platform to be a barrier to participating in this project. So scaffolding is essential. Um, and then circling back to that rights and responsibilities piece. So as consumers and contributors, we need to help our students understand their rights as authors. Um, so we're talking about intellectual property um, and at most institutions, students own their intellectual property. So that means they get to, to decide what they're going to do with it. Um, but then that piece um, as consumers, they have you know, responsibility to ensure that they are using others' intellectual property responsibly, um, both ethically, so if they're citing, and legally if they're giving attribution, um, and that they also have the responsibility to be contributing well-researched evidence-based information. So I'm referring specifically to that uh, gen ed science course that I'm talking about. So if they're creating these learning objects for other students, um, they do have a responsibility to make sure that the research that they're integrating is sound research, right? Um, and then the agency and privacy is huge in the space. Um, and it isn't necessarily separate from the rights and responsibilities. Um, ensuring students are aware of their rights over not only their IP, but also that it comes um, with that comes their right to choose if and how they will participate in this project, um, particularly open scholarship projects. So, and helping them understand that there are associated risks that come with authoring public facing content on the internet, um, especially if, if the topic's controversial or if they fall under a category of um, risk students, um, we don't, we just want to make sure our students understand the risk and, and help them make the choice for themselves and give them alternate options if they don't feel comfortable participating in certain parts, um, making sure there are alternative assignments that they can complete, um, really putting them in the driver's seat. That's what this is all about. Um, helping them see the value of participating, but also respecting their choice to opt out of it. Okay, Amanda's going to lead us through some resources. So a great place to get started for examples is the Open Pedagogy Notebook. It was created by Robin and Rajiv to share examples of open pedagogy. And if, I would also encourage you that if you're doing this kind of work to share examples of the work that you're doing to sort of give back to the community because that's what open is about. Um, the Open Education Workshops for Subject Liaisons by Laura and Ray that I mentioned earlier is linked here. And um, they focused on providing workshop materials to help open educational professionals reach out to subject liaisons and library colleagues to generate buy-in for OER, open pedagogy, and press books. So if you're also doing press books, demos, or trying to get people interested in OER, those workshops also include that. Next slide, please. A guide to making open textbooks with students is a great place to start if your faculty are thinking about opening, authoring open content with students. 
Um, I always highly recommend the OER Starter Kit by Abby Elder. Um, there is a section in there teaching with OER that discusses open pedagogy. Um, a good place to find examples of OER activities like annotation and HI5P are in the OER Activity Sourcebook by Naomi Salmon. Next slide. And then coming soon, I am happy to announce, this will be coming very soon, um, Open Pedagogy Approaches Faculty Library and Student Collaborations. It's a series of case studies for a textbook replacement project, student projects, and open pedagogical design projects. And I talked to Alexis Clifton this week to find out like, when is this coming? When is this coming? And she's hoping by the end of this month or very early July that this will be available. Um, so keep your eye open for that. And, and if, if you want to learn more about the, the open um, project that I work on with the students in the general education science uh, class, I have a chapter in this book that discusses this collaboration in length. And that is it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay and Amanda. What an amazing session. I so appreciate the examples that you've shared and your experiences. You both said I'm not an expert, but I have experience and we are all learning so much from that. So thank you. Um, I will say before I take a few questions, um, there have been many requests for your links. Um, and so a reminder to the audience that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on the OTN um, YouTube along with um, a link to the slide deck, which I know has, as we saw with Lindsay, live links in it to many of the resources and projects that they cited today. So thank you both for making those available to us. Of course. So um, a few questions. Um, the first one is this, uh, so I'm going to read the question aloud now. Okay. The scope of open pedagogy is more limited for those who teach primarily with texts, especially modern post-1923 texts, which can't easily be replaced by OER materials. What are some creative ways you advise faculty on how to adopt open pedagogy for such courses? I'm going to let Amanda take that one because you tend to work more with faculty on, on creative solutions. Yeah, so when I'm thinking about copyrighted material in particular, I think about like, what are the assignments that we could build out that would allow students to engage in um, creating content or finding content that helps concretize those skills that we want them to learn from it. Um, so it could be that you and depending on what platform you're working in and how they're accessing their textbook, um, you can use Hypothesis just on its own through the web browser. So you can annotate um, anything across the, the web, really. Um, so if you were working in a digital ebook or something, they could still do annotation and it would be connected through a group. So that would be one way to still do some annotation exercises. Um, and you could still build out other things for them to do. But when I think about like content creators, so are they building something alongside of it? So um, maybe they're making a study guide mm -hmm. and um, you could build and scaffold around open pedagogy and then building a study guide for the material. So it's, it's about getting creative and looking at the assignments that the faculty have and want to swap out um, and thinking through maybe pain points in their course, like where are concepts where students struggle, um, and how could we engage in that particular point to build an assignment that would be more beneficial and allow them to interact differently than they have in the past. Do you have anything to add as from working from sort of like the student side, Lindsay? Um, no, I really love those examples. And I, I would tend to say, yeah, maybe maybe engage students in creating ancillary content for that course um, that can then be openly licensed. Um, so they might be creating, like Amanda said, a study guide um, that they, they can then openly license and other students, other faculty can take it, revise it, adapt it. Um, I think those are great suggestions. And depending on that's how much content, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, Sarah. I would say, I was just going to say, it's also sort of with my library and hat on, it's also a great place to sort of teach citation. Yeah. So if you are working with a copy to, copyrighted material, they can still cite that text yeah. um, in the work that they're doing. And so that's like another place where we could teach another skill. Yeah, for sure. 
Thank you both. Um, sorry, Ananda, about that. Okay. Uh, this is a good tie-in, I think, to a question we've received, um, which is, have you encountered faculty who cannot give up disposable assignments in favor of tests and quizzes? What do you focus on with them if this is the case? Hmm. I don't know if I've necessarily met resistance with that respect, um, that faculty just aren't ready. But I think just showing them concrete examples helps. Um, so if, if you do find resistance, showing them what could be done and giving them like concrete examples, because I think sometimes it's just so like, it's a, it's, academia has been built on disposable assignments forever. So this is very new and radical to some people. So I think if you can just make those connections, um, it's far easier to engage that resistance. Um, I have encountered resistance from faculty on student participation in these projects. So for example, um, my colleague Heather and I, uh, we were presenting to, um, I forget what department, I think it was like the biology department or something. Um, and one of the faculty members said, well, do you, do you publish the D work, like the, D, the student work that might be a D? Like, do you still put that on the live web? Um, and there was this huge resistance of like, how could you do that? Like you're giving the university a bad name. And um, what I always say to that is like, yeah, we do. Like this is student work and none of it is D work. <laughs> like, um, just putting that out there. But I also try to remind them that D work, D work, um, can be revised and improved next semester. And that's a huge like learning opportunity for students to come in and say, okay, like this section needs a little bit of work, right? Their citations aren't great. Uh, they didn't use great resources. How can I improve this? So I think, um, you know, I've certainly met that resistance of giving students the authority to publish. Um, how dare you? So uh, I think that's something we, we have to work on and just show faculty like why this does work and why we want to empower our students. Lindsay, along that line, and this is our last question, mm -hmm. um, do you find that open pedagogy works better in some in upper division courses where students have already gained some level of subject confidence? Um, I haven't worked with faculty and students in upper level courses in this work. Mm -hmm. um, I've only worked in lower level gen ed classes and it, it works wonderfully there. I think it would work excellent in any class, any discipline, honestly, any level. Um, Amanda, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I would agree. Uh, I find that it varies by discipline and, um, and how much the faculty wants to engage in that. And then, Tagging back to the previous question, um, when I have met faculty resistance around like the grading, like whether it's good work or bad work, um, I then talk to them about open peer review and setting it up like an editorial board and they have to go through the, that process of peer review in order to get their stuff published. It's another way to look at it. And that helps assuage some of those things, particularly in STEM fields with faculty. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that I think that it works differently maybe in the different levels and you could maybe have upper division and graduate level students like author textbooks and do like footnotes and stuff that are a little more in depth if you want something really polished at the end. But I like the idea of students building upon what was there before and making it better. Yeah, I think uh, to that point, you want to know who your audience is, right? Like with the up, upper level graduate courses, like maybe the audience, like Amanda said, maybe you are building an open textbook, right? Um, for lower level courses, maybe they're just building a resource for students, content for students by students, right? There's, there's a difference there. So knowing your audience. Speaking of knowing our audience, it is uh, exactly the hour. I want to thank you both so much for a wonderful presentation and also want to thank our audience um, for great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them all, um, but thank you. This was a wonderful session and um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us.